Good morning. I've got the pleasure of announcing our next keynote speaker. Uh, Jean Holm, as the evangelist for data.gov, she leads the collaboration and builds communities with the public, educators, developers, and international and state governments in using open government data. Data.gov is a flagship open government initiative for the US government. Jean is also the chief knowledge architect at NASA's Jet Propulsion Laboratory, driving innovation through social media, virtual worlds, gaming ontologies, and collaborative systems, including the award-winning NASA public portal, www.nasa.gov. She's also a fellow of the United Nations International Academy of Astronautics and Distinguished Instructor at UCLA with more than 120 publications on information systems, knowledge management, and innovation. I'm also proud to announce that she's finishing her PhD at Claremont, and she should be receiving her doctorate title in the next couple of months. Jean? Hi all, thank you so much for, uh, for being here today and for sharing the journey that we've been doing um, in the US government, working with innovation and trying to figure out ways forward. So I wanna share a little bit about that journey with you today. Um, again, I'm uh, Jean Holm, I uh, am here on behalf of uh, UCLA and the W3C, but also to represent the work I've been doing for the last 30 years at NASA and with the White House in working to drive innovation solutions across really distributed communities. So when we think about innovation and where those ideas are coming from in your organization, those ideas for innovation might come from employees. They might come from customers. Um, we often think about satisfied customers who have good ideas about the next innovation, uh, but actually the real areas for potential innovation come from customers you have not yet reached and customers who are about to leave or have left because they're frustrated. So those people who are not utilizing your services today are often the places where the best ideas can come from. Certainly competitors and also challenges. And part of what I'll share today is how we can take challenges and create them into opportunities, how we look at the insurmountable problems we might face and be able to find the opportunities for innovation within them. So we'll look at the intersection of these three different areas. One is what does sort of emergent technology make possible for us in the area of innovation? The second is what will the customer want tomorrow? So, he, so it's not sort of looking at what the customers are asking for today, but trying to predict maybe even before they know what sorts of new services and products they'll want. And then what of those technologies and ideas and capabilities can be productized in a way that we can package and sell and provision? So we'll start with the idea of finding opportunity and challenge. So how many people here saw the movie Apollo 13? I've heard the story about Apollo 13. So Apollo 13 was one of our NASA missions that uh, was heading to the moon, but unfortunately had a catastrophic failure on board. Three astronauts were left in space with no way home necessarily, trying to figure out how to jury rig in a very small capsule a solution to get back. So three great guys, but they had very few resources. So there's a great scene in the movie that is trying to understand how are we going to solve this problem. Everybody on the ground thinks that these guys are essentially already, already going to be killed. But in fact, what we find is that it is a matter of making do with what we have. So they take all of the components that are on the, the, um, on the lunar module, they, they dump the engineering prototypes of those onto the table, and they say, all right, so this is what we have to work with. We don't have anything else. There's no magic here. It's just a really wicked problem and a really hard issue. And so we have to figure out how to take a square peg and fit it in a round hole. Literally, they're trying to make parts and pieces from one of the um, aspects of the module fit into another. So 
So, so this is kind of the culture that I've grown up in, the culture of making do sometimes when there's almost nothing to make do with. So we looked at the, the ways in which NASA drives innovation, the ways in which we try to create new solutions to complex and wicked problems in a way that has often very scarce resources, and yet we want to reach out and try to gather as many innovative ideas as possible. So we looked at this and we thought, is this serendipity or is it science? Is it something that just happens because you have really smart people who are put into a situation? Or can we figure out a way to drive a science behind the idea of innovation? And so I'll share with you what we've done that I think is really transferable to the telecommunications industry for both internal and external innovation. And part of this is really about building communities, building online communities, building communities in which you create trust. Trust that transcends internal and external folks, that helps to create a shared vision, that brings solutions to really wickedly hard problems, because everybody knows solutions to the simple ones, but the thing that's gonna keep you ahead of your competitors, the thing that's gonna make you really drive innovation is when you take on those difficult areas and then recognizing and rewarding contributions. So part of what we decided to do at NASA and we did this actually kind of through the auspices of knowledge management and collaboration, was, um, was to look at how can we start to build this sense of shared vision with the public and with who, who for us are our customers, the taxpayers. So thank you to all of you American citizens who pay your taxes, really appreciate it. The, um, so we wanted to start creating that shared vision online. So part of what we first did is we re-architected the NASA portal, so the www.nasa.gov homepage, and, and created the sense of a shared vision where we understood now, by looking at the traffic and the data, what people wanted, what people were going to, what people were interested in. Because we had our hypothesis, we had our, our sense of what people wanted, but until we architected an online environment where we could actually track those statistics, we couldn't tell for sure exactly where people were headed and exactly what people wanted. So doing algorithms on the search analytics and looking at the back end behavior, we could start to understand what people were interested in. Then we started to build those communities through social media. So even in the early days, we were the first government agency to use social media. Um, so creating Facebook pages with different personas for different kinds of missions, um, creating YouTube channels, working with social media and podcasts, um, and, and also understanding that not all, uh, not all social media is just about engaging, but part of it is about transforming the understanding. So as we started to gather this community to, to create uh, conversations in ways that let people not only talk to us back and forth, but also to share within the community, we found that what was happening was we, we gathered a huge group of people together that cared about the same sorts of things that we cared about and that helped to modify our vision for the future. So part of it was not just hearing from them and broadcasting, but the big part was listening to them and then showing them where we changed our plans based upon their feedback. In fact, uh, recently, you might have heard there was a government shutdown <laughs> in October, and during that time, we were all prohibited from engaging in any activities at all, including on social media. And so this cadre of folks that we had sort of gathered and rallied around the NASA vision, started tweeting out all of the news and updates that were happening in space-related activities under the hashtag, what would NASA tweet? So it was a really great way in which we started to see that people were engaged beyond our ability to sort of drive them forward, that they were able to move forward and innovate on their own. Uh, one of the areas that we also started looking at innovation was trying to help people understand the data that we were trying to communicate, but in different ways. So there's a lot of talk um, these days about climate change. And you, you kind of live and breathe that here on the Pacific Rim um, because of you know, the rising sea levels and issues related to climate change affect island nations much more than anybody else. 
So as we started looking at that, we realized there was a huge gap in people's understanding from us saying there's three degrees of global warming to them understanding what that really meant. And we could show maps and projections, but it didn't really make a difference. So, so we created a space in uh, virtual world. This one's actually called Second Life. Um, and in Second Life, what we did is we created a center for, for, for global change, had people look at what kinds of uh, data we got back. But more importantly, we said, OK, so say you have a home in Honolulu, and there's three degrees of global warming. As your avatar starts walking through the environment, this is what your living room looks like. So suddenly, this idea that three degrees of global warming means a 10-foot rise in sea level makes a much more sort of guttural, literal reaction. So trying to communicate to customers the data behind your decisions is sometimes we find needs to be done in many different kinds of formats. The other thing we did is, um, I don't know if you guys all have more money than you know what to do with, but we are always broke at NASA. And part of what we have is we have a plethora of data. So we have troves and troves of data, but not necessarily enough people to analyze it or, or money to pay people to analyze it. And we are, uh, as you know, exploring the surface of Mars. And we were looking for trying to find the next landing spot and a potential colonization spot on the surface of Mars. And it's, it's a bit tricky because there's geologic features you want, but you also need it near certain kinds of uh, climate areas and certain kinds of terrain. And it's not something that can just be analyzed by data alone, but you actually have to visually look at some of these images. So what we did is we created an online environment in a game called Be a Martian. You actually, anybody can be a Martian. So I know you want, might want to be an astronaut. You can do that too, but you can also be a Martian. So you can go on and play the game. And what you're actually doing in playing the game is going through 500,000 high resolution images of the surface of Mars and working with these sort of algorithms we've built in the back of the game, helping us identify the next place where we're going to send robots and humans to Mars. So we're actually sort of recruited citizen scientists from all over the world to help us with this. So part of it is that we realize that the most innovative, smart, crazily brilliant people on the planet are not necessarily rocket scientists. You know, you'd think at NASA that we would have um, employed a lot of those people, but in fact, the vast majority of the smart people on the planet don't work for NASA, don't work for the space organization, and are all citizens and folks out in the world who can help us innovate, help us understand, and help create that future. Um, and, and so while we did all of this on the outside, looking at communities and collaboration for innovation, we also realized, I mean, OK, it is actually rocket science. So we wanted to make sure that everything had the rigor behind it that we needed. So we could be crazy and wacky and innovative, but we also needed to be rigorous in the engineering and how we were going to apply that to our core mission of exploration. So at the same time, we looked at these communities internally. So this is part of our NASA engineering network that looks at these communities for collaboration. We bring together experts from across the organization, internal and external. We work across the entire supply chain, um, which has been difficult at times to build that trust because we're actually bringing competitors in to an innovative brainstorming space, asking them to share information, not proprietary, but, but information which could be competitive. And then going through a way of letting the community validate the ability for us to innovate on those ideas. So any idea is a good idea, but we use a rigorous engineering process in these communities so that what comes out at the end is something that we can actually productize and put on a spacecraft. We also realized that part of our challenge was actually just finding our experts. So NASA is a pretty big organization, 118,000 people distributed around the globe and, and in space. And part of what we're challenged with is understanding everybody's area of expertise. So just think at your company. You, know, you may know that people who work in a specific part of it, but do you know all of the things that they've done in the past, all of the things that they can contribute? So we actually created a, a system that just integrates several different data sources across the agency that we already have that lets us find those innovation experts and lets us find the people that we need to pull on in on certain specific projects. So the way that we do this is we look at our publications database, we look at the training records, we look at 
people's education history and their work history, both at our company and, and before, and we put this together in a semantic web technology that lets us find not only the person who we're looking for based on certain attributes, but other people like them. So if I'm looking for somebody like Mark and he's not available, I can find the other people who are like Mark at the organization, or other people who have similar kinds of characteristics. So after NASA, I've actually brought this up and I now work with um, data.gov, which is, which is with the um, current White House administration and open government initiative. And we're looking at really taking this innovation globally. So when we talk about communities for innovation at NASA, it's very focused on some uh, specific kinds of technology, some specific kinds of mission issues that we're dealing with. But as we look more globally at all of the data that is gathered by the US government, part of what we're challenged here with is looking at big data, data analytics, and trying to put data from many, many different sources together. So data.gov provides 400,000 data resources, free and open for anybody to use, from across the government, including uh, some of the data sets here in Honolulu and Hawaii, so thanks, Bert. Um, and also from data sets across the government from 175 different agencies. Many of these available in data services, so it's very easy to just be able to pull this data and use it for anything that you might want to. We've developed communities around this. So we looked at issues where citizens wanted to talk more about specific kinds of data or the specific kinds of things that could be done with that data, and then also where there were national priorities. So things like public safety, energy, health, uh, manufacturing business, ethics, and open transparency in government. All of these are places where we brought together communities of public and private citizens, of uh, officials from the White House uh, and agencies, as well as a lot of people from industry to try to really understand how we can get more innovative. So one of these areas is agriculture. And in agriculture, the focus is not just on sort of how we can help um, specific farmers in the US, but how we can help farmers all over the world. So partly, we build on your backbones of this vast distribution of mobile technology. And we know that farmers in Africa um, want to get information, but maybe they only have a mobile phone with SMS. And so we're actually able to work with developers all over the world. In this case, we have this great little app called iCow. <laughs> iCow lets you text to a machine that says, my cow has a certain kind of symptom and I don't know how to treat it. And you'll get back an answer that is geographically relevant, that tells you where to get the treatment, what can be done, and how to take care of your cow. So these are all interesting ways of actually taking big problems like world hunger and trying to solve them in a, in a doable, um, facilitated way. We also worked with the Red Cross in looking at how we can manage during a disaster. So um, the Red Cross puts out different apps for people to use. We were working with them on one for hurricanes. And it was just before Hurricane Sandy hit. So as we realized that this was coming, um, the hurricane was forming, we rushed the development of this app forward and were able to, to create it and deploy it the night that Hurricane Sandy hit the East Coast. We had 700,000 downloads of this app that first day. And what happened was it, the app lets you find safe transportation sectors. It monitored in real time traffic and the ways in which people could get across the city. It lets you notify and, and sort of pin up on a board that you were safe in case other people were looking for you and you could see if your loved ones were safe. So it aggregated all of this information in ways that just increased the ability for public safety to happen, even in the midst of a disaster. And then perhaps most relevant to you, there's um, a whole issue, initiative going on with energy. So Green Button is an initiative where the energy utility companies provide to the user their historical energy use data. And we now have 45 different companies like Opower that create applications and analysis out of this so that as a citizen, I can upload the information and be able to find out whether or not I'm actually going to be um, best poised to put in solar panels or use um, energy more wisely. So as we think about this, really think about using communities as the, the linchpin for innovation, communities that reach internally and externally to build the trust along those communities and really look at them as being the place for data validation and co-creation of that data. Everywhere you look, there's data. It's just there waiting for you to use. 
So the question is, what are you going to do with it? Thank you very much.